the first year can be somewhat challenging. So that's certainly something that should be discussed upfront, even though you have no idea what you're getting into. I think it's it's helpful to to really talk through through this with your partner. Hello, and welcome to the Elevator Careers podcast, sponsored by the Allred Group. I am your host, Matt Allred. In this podcast, we talk to the people whose lives and careers are dedicated to the vertical transportation industry to inform and share lessons learned, building upon the foundation of those who have gone before to inspire the next generation of elevator careers. Today, our guest is Dominic Saxenheimer, the president of Maven Group, a mergers and acquisitions advisory firm specializing exclusively in the elevator industry. Dominic joined Otis Elevator in 2006 and held various finance positions in New York, Chicago, South Carolina, and their U.S. headquarters before being promoted to Senior Manager of Mergers and Acquisitions for North America in 2013. In 2016, Dominic left Otis to start Maven Group, where Dominic and his team mainly focus on helping independent elevator companies who contemplate selling their business. Dominic, welcome to the show. Hey, Matt, great to be here. Really an honor to be part of your program. Thank you. I'm excited to talk with you. It's uh, it's always a pleasure. And um, I'm excited to learn more about your business and and obviously about you. So I'm, I'm curious, how did you get started in the elevator industry? Yeah, by sheer coincidence, really. Uh, I grew up in Germany and lived there for 30 years and then uh, met my wife who lived in New York. So I relocated. Uh, to be with her and try to make ends meet, worked for actually AIG, the big insurance company, okay. as a financial analyst, because uh, my English was pretty poor, so I focused on numbers, and then didn't enjoy that too much, and Otis was looking for a financial analyst uh, after about a year or two. So I joined them, and um, yeah, really, really liked what I was doing there, liked the the culture, not just of the company, but also the whole industry, and uh yeah, started my my career with them and bounced around quite a bit, and that's how it all started. Very cool. So you got to know the elevator industry from the inside out, essentially, kind of. Yeah, I guess New York is kind of a good place to start. I mean, it's where sure, and it's where Mister Otis introduced the elevator over 150 <laughs> years ago. Exactly. Um, so worked for them there, uh, moved to Chicago for a while, became their lead finance guy or mini CFO for the Southern operation, which was about 16 states, I think, in the Caribbean islands. And then I moved to the headquarters to kind of oversee financial planning and analysis across North America and started to get into acquisitions really during that time and was their director for all mergers and acquisitions across uh, across North America and Canada. Wow. Yeah. So you really got to look at a lot of a lot of different businesses and see how they were running, good, bad, everything in between. You, you probably saw a lot. Yeah, certainly. Um, first, actually, within Otis, right, got to know a lot of different markets because obviously the the industry works a little bit differently in Manhattan compared to I don't know Chattanooga, Tennessee, or sure. or or any other place. Um, so that was very helpful. And then, yeah, certainly looking at at smaller companies or larger companies on the independent side was was eye opening because, as you can imagine, there's also a wide range of of approaches um, to the industry. So that was very educational and. Uh, Never gets boring, quite frankly. I've been doing this for a while now, but uh, it's still very exciting actually to learn how certain people set up their business and how they succeed. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just chuckling because I'm sure you looked at some some uh, you know financial statements and wondering how they succeed, right? <laughs> how are these people in business? <laughs> yeah, no, we see we see all kinds of things. When we see people who are very sophisticated and invest a sure. lot of money in IT systems and others. Just open the drawers and tell you, you know, this is this is the last thirty years right here, um, and it's a pile of paper. But um, but that's exactly what makes it fun, right? You you never quite know uh, what you're going to get when you first start uh, on a journey with with, with any customer. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's it, it's been fun. It's it's been very re- rewarding, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm very happy to be in the position that I'm in today. Very cool, very cool. So, when did you realize that you had a passion for this industry? Yeah, I really never thought I would, right? I mean, when I was 15, right, I wanted to win the Soccer World Cup and not, not, certainly not wanted to be in the, didn't sure. want to be in the elevator industry. So no, I think it's really the people. I mean, starting starting to work um, for Otis in New York of all places in a huge uh, open office with cubicles, I was just exposed to the people who really make things work. 
And uh, that fascinated me early on because obviously I was more on the finance side and um, in a large company that has a certain level of sophistication when it comes to tracking numbers and tracking sure. all that. But at the same time, at the end of the day, it's a, it's really a blue collar job, right? And it's real people who give you very straightforward feedback that you might not always enjoy or agree <laughs> with the first time you hear it. But it, it, I think it's that combination that I find fascinating. On the one hand, right, it's a very um, sophisticated business. You, you, you really need to be aware of codes. You need to be aware of, of your financials and all kinds of other things. But you, people put their safety and their lives in your hand, really, right? So you have that side. But at the same time, it's, it's real people um, who work extremely hard, who are used to a call at two in the morning and then you jump out of bed and you're ready to, to jump through hoops for your customers. So um, I think that's really what 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 fascinated me the, the combination of those two things and really the people who make it work. Sure, sure. And so maybe this is redundant, but what what is it that you absolutely love about this industry? So that, that's exactly it. I think it's it's people's drive to to make things happen and and, and uh, um, people's attitude that there is no such thing as a problem. Right? There's always a lot of solutions that you can fight about, but. Um, that's that's very good to see, right? And coming from more of a financial background where you spend maybe more time, a lot more time talking about the problem and how to frame the problem and how to do this and this and this with the problem. It's just very good to be around people who who always work on solutions. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. So how, how long were you at Otis? 10 years, you... actually. Okay. 10 years to the day. Okay. So what, what was it that motivated you to jump out and say, hey, I'm going to do this on my own? Yeah, good question. Um, so as we looked at deals at Otis, there was always kind of a discrepancy between the expectations um, from a large company right, that would look at an acquisition with a bunch of attorneys and with a bunch of accountants and with a safety committee and all that on the one side, right? And on the other side of the table, you typically had a guy and his wife who started a company 25 years ago sure. and who tried to do their best to kind of keep up with all the requests that, that, that were coming. But there, were always kind of, there was always this mismatch between these two worlds. And I figured that there should be a better way to kind of bridge that gap and to be a translator. Because quite often, right, the smaller independent company would really uh, misrepresent their company, um, not on purpose, but just by not quite knowing. Sure. Um, what certain questions meant and they would say, oh, I have this many units and this is roughly my billing amount and all that. And then quite often during diligence, right, we would find out that it wasn't true. Uh, clearly not because uh, the sellers tried to be uh, funny, right, and, and, and lead us on. That was not the intent at all, but it was just so many questions at the same time that people just got kind of lost in the shuffle. So um, I really saw an opportunity to help them. Um, to get, first of all, better deals for them, because once you represent what you have in an appropriate way, then the diligence process just becomes a confirmation of what you've said before. Um, clearly, right, you um, you kind of, at the end of the day, you get more money if you have someone like me in the corner also. I guess we'll talk about that in a second. But um, I really felt the need for, for someone to, um, to fill that gap. Um, and then secondly, uh, in my prior life, right, I always had... Uh, that kind of urge to kind of be more of an entrepreneur than a uh, than an employee, and this was a great opportunity. And um, I have to give a shout out here to my business partner Bill Vieri, who kind of gave me the the final nudge to kind of jump out of the comfort of of, of a nice career with Otis. Sure, if you can um, jump into, together, into, it's a, it's a little more um, <laughs> have some yeah, no, absolutely, exactly. And, and he had a big shoulder to cry on, so it was great. Right, he's he's. Uh, He's a perfect mentor for for, for this kind of uh, venture. Uh, still, still helps me in there. So, um, yeah, it's, I guess those were the were the big reasons. I think um, I'm just better in that environment as an entrepreneur rather than an employee. And secondly, I think that there really was a need. And I think um, just looking back over the last five years, I think that initial assessment was right. I think there is a need, and uh, people seem to seem to call me every once in a while and ask for our services. So that's. That's good. Yeah. Well, I, I can only imagine how, how intimidating that would be. Like you say, a, a guy and his wife and Hey, we've been working our, our tails off for 25, 30 years. And, and here's, here's what we think we have. And, and this line of, like you say, attorneys and financial analysts and, and just mm -hmm. that to me would be really intimidating. You know, just the, I don't, I don't have that kind of arsenal to, <laughs> to go up against this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is kind of the the value that we provide, right? Because if you are an owner and this is your baby, this is the biggest 
transaction that you will ever embark on right in your life. It, it's a life changing event, not not just because very often you retire after the transaction, but also financially, right? It is a life altering um, watershed event really in your life. So it is very uh, very stressful to go through that. But uh, since that's all I do, right? It's it becomes easier and it becomes it becomes repetitive. You can anticipate certain things, and I think sharing that knowledge and preparing people for what's what's about to happen. Um, and helping them prepare all the documentation that will be required. I think that's really what we um, what we bring to the table, among other things. Yeah. Now, thank you for for uh, you know addressing that. Um, is there anything you would have done differently in in starting your own business and in, in jumping out, leaving Otis, if you could do it again? I mean, the standard answer, I guess, is I would have I would would have done it sooner. <laughs> but at the same time that I'm saying this, um, it's not really true because I think. Part of the reasons why we are, are somewhat successful here is because I spent a long time learning the industry first before I tried to kind of uh, tell people everything I know. So I think it was good to have that 10-year learning period. Um, so not really. Um, I think it was, uh, it was uh, it's, it's, it's like, like having kids. But sometimes it's, it's better that you don't know how tough the first year is. <laughs> <laughs> and the first year was certainly tough. Um, but I don't think there's anything you can change about that. It's just the first year for any entrepreneur will be rough. Yeah. Um, but no, I think overall uh, it, it worked out really well. Right. Well, and it, and it sounds like you you definitely did well in in finding your partner, Bill, at, at the time you did. And I, I think you've told me that uh, Otis was actually acquiring his company. And so you kind of got to face off across the table. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, we be, we basically became friends and partners while we were negotiating against each other. <laughs> but I think we really appreciated the honesty, the integrity that we saw in each other, and um, we also appreciated that uh, you can fight hard about bigger amounts of money while still keeping a sense of humor. I think that goes a long way. Um, as you can imagine, right? Many of these transactions, going back to what I said before. Um, are very emotional for sellers, but it, it is a life-changing event. Sure. And it, so people become tense at times, with the, and, it, it, and it's very stressful. There's a lot of uh, different uh, balls in the air that you have to juggle. So every once in a while, you have to kind of find the right moment to to add a little levity and, and, and maybe uh, remind people that it's all good, actually, that, that usually you enter a transaction because it's a, it's a good deal for both sure. sides. A win-win. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges you face in the work that you do? Um, yeah, I think that's one of them, right? I mean, there's always emotion and it's, it's a complex environment. Um, and even if we've been through it many times, there's always something new, right? There's always something um, where you have to pivot, right? Everybody... I think it's a Mike Tyson quote. Uh, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> that, yeah. so you kind of have to uh, wait for that moment, no matter how much you slip and slide. But right? at some point, something unforeseen will will happen. Um, and, and again, I, th- I think there's there's typically um, a lot of emotion involved. But that's I think also one of the the key values that we provide is is to be kind of the the, the neutral source, right? So if a if a seller wants to voice frustration they can come to us and speak to us, right? And then we translate that to the buyer. So everybody can yell at us, but the relationship between seller and buyer remains intact, right? Because they can go through us. And and actually, quite frankly, that also happens between partners who own a business, right? Every once in a while, you might be in a situation where people want to break up a company because they don't get along anymore. So it's very helpful to have a a third party there um, who can kind of mitigate between, uh, between those between those two people or three sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, so in all these transactions, all these businesses you've looked at, what, what would you say is one of the craziest things you've seen? I mean, that would be a long list. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and we are typically right on every single transaction. We are bound by non-disclosure agreements, but without naming names, I think you can share something for, actually for my time at Otis where we're getting close to closing a transaction. And there's always a long checklist of things that are about to happen. Um, and one of them is a drug test for the, for the owners and for, for the technicians. And we actually tried to close a deal where all three owners ended up failing the drug test. Oops. Um, so okay. that was <laughs> certainly unforeseen and um, somewhat funny, or it's funny now at the time it wasn't because everything got delayed and we had to work through the IUC to. Wow. You know, Maybe they were issue. celebrating a little too early. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But um um, yeah, I guess that's, that, that's one of many examples. Yeah. Thank you. No, thanks for sharing that. Um, 
So what would you say is one of the biggest mistakes that company owners make when it comes time to transition? Because I obviously there are def- different ways you can go about it. You could hand it over to junior, you can, you know, sell it, you can, you know, different yeah, ways. I think, I think a lot of people kind of uh, rush into it and don't take the time to really think about what they want to do, right? And um, there is no really good answer right there there's no one size fits all answer how to transition a business right you might you might want to keep it until you're 75 there's nothing wrong with that at all sure you might also want to go out earlier so i think a lot of people just wake up one morning and say you know now i'm frustrated or now i'm tired or now i'm too old um, or now i don't like my partner anymore rather than having a long-term plan so we try to work with companies to kind of uh, have a little bit of a longer planning horizon right try to um, really guide them there because as I said there's no right or wrong answer of how to do that um, Sure. and we do obviously at the same time try to if we have two, three, four years to prepare them we do try to help them uh, make the company as, att- as attractive as we can whether it's through route optimization or uh, through um, making their maintenance contracts more robust or whatever it is right? or hiring an outside accountant or maybe we can help a little bit Um so I think one of the mistakes is to yeah wake up one morning and say, okay, so I'm selling my company now um, or react to a phone call because somebody calls you and says, hey, I have a lot of money. I want to buy your company now. That's also not really the best way to go about it. Right? Sure. One should always, um, going back to the values that I, th- I think Maven Group provides, um, one should always kind of try to see what the market really has to say, right? And you don't get, it's like when you sell a house, right? The first guy sure. that comes through the door, the first offer you get is not the best one that you get. So um, it's always best to kind of, uh, yeah, go out, make sure that you protect it through non-disclosure agreements. And then you talk to more than one person to kind of really see what the what the market has to say about your company. And then that's that's how you get the highest price. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe you've already answered this. What What advice would you give to someone? You know, maybe they didn't plan three or four years ahead. But they realize, who knows, maybe it was a death or an illness that say, mm-hmm. you know what, we really can't continue. What what advice would you offer them? Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's uh, um, I'm, I'm trying, trying to sell my company in, in this answer. But I think you, you, you really need help, but you need to surround yourself with people who, who actually have done this before, right? It's, it's important to speak with someone who has done this, certainly get your accountant involved. You always need legal advice, but it's important to hire someone, again, who has experience in this specific field. There are great attorneys who specialize on divorces or real estate or all kinds of other things. But sure. uh, when you sell your company, you really need to engage someone who um, who, who knows this arena. Um, and then, yeah, again, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but uh, just being prepared in terms of just keep your record straight and clean and, and, uh, and have solid financials. It's, it's one of the key aspects, really. Very cool. So let's let's finish up with this last question, and and that is, having seen as many businesses as as you have, what mm-hmm. advice would you give one give to someone who, you know, maybe, you know, he and his buddy want to start their own business? Because I do hear from mm-hmm. a number of people that hey, I want to get out and you know, start my own, you know, yeah, business. Um, a few obvious things, but you really have to be confident about. Uh, your ability to kind of withstand adversity um, because no matter, I, I always tell people you, you should make two plans, two completely different plans. One is let's assume everything works out perfectly. Right? How, would sure. you, how would you deal with a lot of customers after one year, right? Are you really ready to take on the world? Um, that's the one scenario that I think you should plan for. And then obviously you should also have the worst case scenario um, in mind. How much, how long can you survive? Right. Um, uh, who are the customers that you will definitely come with you or that you think that you really feel strongly about, but who are kind of, they are, it's a 50%, it's a 40%, it's a 30% because um, one of the experiences I made, and I think that I've heard from many business owners is you always have a list of like five people that will definitely choose you as, 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 as a service provider. And sure enough, four of the five will will, will not, not come over. Right? <laughs> um, so I think you have to prepare. You have to be prepared for, for for those two things. And then, I think another thing that people might underestimate has nothing to do with the elevator industry is, I think you have to make sure that your your um, 
supporting staff, I guess, in your real life, whether it's your spouse or, or, or other partners that, that you might live with, um, that they're really on board because it is, it is kind of a wild ride. I'm sure you've experienced this in your own business. Sure. Um, the first year can be somewhat challenging. So that's certainly something that should be discussed upfront, even though you have no idea what you're getting into. I think it's, it's helpful to, to really talk through, through this with your partner. Perfect. Before Thank you, you so much. Pull the trigger. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, any any parting thoughts? Anything that comes to mind that you maybe haven't had a chance to say that is just begging to get out? No, I think again, as I said before, I'm, I'm really really proud to be part of this podcast. I think you're doing a great thing here for the industry, and um, now I can can wait to listen to the next one and uh, yeah, keep up the good work. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you being on here, Dominic. It's great talking to you again. Wish you all the best. Thanks. Same to you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Elevator Careers podcast, sponsored by the Allred Group, a leader in elevator industry recruiting. You can check us out online at elevatorcareers.net. Please subscribe, and until next time, stay safe.